Welcome to another episode of Catch This. My name is Trudy Ray. I'm sure you've heard the word herd immunity thrown around in the media in the last two and a half years. But what exactly is it? The classical definition of herd immunity describes a scenario where a large enough percentage of the population has acquired either natural or vaccine-induced immunity against an infectious disease thereby indirectly protecting a minority of individuals who are not immune, who are dispersed throughout the population. During this pandemic, many prominent scientists have stated that it is impossible to achieve herd immunity in the context of COVID-19, leading some to question the benefits of a mass SARS-CoV-2 vaccination campaign. In this video, I want to explain why this thinking is flawed. Don't go away. Traditionally, herd immunity is thought to create a barrier for the transmission of infectious agents, resulting not only in prevention of disease, but also prevention of infection. This understanding was based on previous observations that vaccination against polio virus, measles virus, and other pathogens led to drastic reductions in the incidence of disease burden. It is therefore reasonable to assume that if there is no disease, there is probably also no virus, and hence no viral infection or transmission of virus. Right? Makes sense. However, nobody ever followed up past vaccination campaigns with regular testing programs. So we actually have no way of knowing whether vaccination prevented infection and transmission. Considering that the vast majority of poliovirus infections are asymptomatic, it is possible that some poliovirus infections and transmission occurred even after vaccination, despite the fact that those infections did not lead to disease. And this is particularly likely in view of recent news stories. The widespread testing measures adopted during the present pandemic have revealed the approximate frequency of asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infections, giving us a clearer understanding of the difference and dynamics between disease and infection. The type of immunity that prevents both disease and infection is called sterilizing immunity. This concept was discussed previously in episode 29, linked above. Check it out. Do SARS-CoV-2 vaccines induce sterilizing immunity? The answer to this question is complicated. There are many studies showing that most people have high levels of antibodies in the months following vaccination. And this large proportion of circulating antibodies could likely sequester an incoming virus before it has a chance to enter cells infect them and replicate. In this sense, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines do induce sterilizing immunity, but only within a certain time period after vaccination. As antibody levels contract over time, a normal process, they leave behind a baseline population of memory B cells that can quickly expand and mass produce new antibodies upon a subsequent encounter with SARS-CoV-2. Likewise, memory T cells can quickly react to incoming virus and virus-triggered signals and destroy infected cells. Therefore, it is likely that when circulating SARS-CoV-2-specific antibody levels decline months and years after vaccination, the collective activity of memory immune cells will protect one from disease, but probably not infection, meaning that the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines no longer induce sterilizing immunity at that time. In other words, vaccinated people could briefly replicate and transmit low levels of virus, at least until memory immune responses kick in, which then prevent illness and additional viral replication and spread. The emergence of new variants that are not as well recognized by existing vaccine-induced antibodies may also allow for some increased viral transmission, thus slowing down the establishment of immunity in the population. However, immune responses are not binary. Check out Catch This Episode 7. And even a low-level immune response that doesn't protect against infection and spread, but prevents serious disease, can play a critical role in slowing down the pandemic. Vaccination has historically been very effective at suppressing community outbreaks, despite the fact that most vaccines, if any, do not induce sterilizing immunity. Vaccination or natural immunity do not have to prevent all infections, and immunity does not have to last a lifetime 
for a pandemic to end. Pediatrician and vaccinologist Paul Offit defines herd immunity as the point where the serious disease burden is reduced sufficiently so as to no longer overwhelm the healthcare system. It's becoming pretty clear that the pandemic is slowing down in the US, especially in the context of severe disease, hospitalization, and death, and that this is likely due to increased SARS-CoV-2 immunity among US residents. It is therefore likely that reduced illness and a shortened period of transmission from immune individuals will also reduce the overall rate of community infection and transmission. And in the end, it doesn't really matter whether we call it herd immunity, community immunity, or some other name. The pandemic will end because a majority of the population is no longer susceptible to severe COVID-19. That's it for today. Thanks again for listening. My name is Trudy Ray. I'll see you next time on Catch This.